Hello, my name is Jeffrey Seglin. I am a senior lecturer and director of Harvard Kennedy School's communications program, where for many years I've been teaching a course on column and opinion writing. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the basics of how to write an opinion column. One of the things I realized early on when I was teaching this course at a different university was the importance of giving the students or people I'm talking to an idea of what a column is. So two weeks into the course, a student asked me, can you define what a column is? I realized that's probably was something I should have done when the class first began. So I start every class now by giving some basic characteristics of a column. They're typically short, 800 words or less. They have a clearly defined point, clearly defined point of view, a clarity of thinking, and a strong, unique voice of the writer. An opinion column is a column where it is important to, for the writer to have an opinion, unlike a news article where they're reporting the facts. An opinion column, it's a place where it's not only permissible, but expected that you will have a strong opinion. When we talk about opinion columns, often we'll interchange that with the, the name op-ed. And um, an op-ed column, the name of an op-ed column comes from a unique place. Early on, when op-ed columns were writing, they actually got their name from um, a geographical thing, where they appeared in the newspaper. If you know a, a daily newspaper, a print newspaper, typically in the front section of the newspaper, if you opened it up, you would see that in the, the back spread on the one side, there would be the editorials from the newspaper itself, and then on the opposite page, there would be editorials from others. So this is how the op-ed got its name, opposite editorial page, or short, um, it would be uh, li listed as op-ed. These days, because not everything is on a linear fashion anymore, because we're no longer reading the newspaper all the time in print, an op-ed has become to stand in as any type of opinion column. So it no longer has that geographical reference unless you're reading the print version of the newspaper. This leads to the idea when you think of having um, a clear point, there are three basic questions that I tell anybody when they are writing a column. If you can answer these questions when you're writing a column, you can basically know if you have a, a strong, focused, good column to write. And these questions are, do I have a point? Uh, because in a column, you basically, in 800 words, have space for one clear, overarching point you want to make in a column. And the whole column should support that overarching point that you make. There's not a lot of room to write a thesis. There's not a lot of room to write a book. You have space for one point to make strongly. So that's the first question I ask. The second question I ask actually comes from the fact that I am married uh, to the woman who was my first book editor. And she's since gone on to become a psychotherapist, which I still maintain has nothing to do with having been my editor for 20 years. But she um, she reads everything I write. So when I write a week, I now write a weekly ethics column, um, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. And before I file it, she always reads it for me. And initially, I would ask her, do I have a point? And then I learned it was important for me to ask that second question and ask her what she thinks that point is. Because often the point she thought I was making was not the point I intended to make. And often it was better than the uh, the point I intended to make, but it required me to go back and make sure I supported that in, that point as clearly as possible. And the third question that's really important to answer when you're writing a column is who cares? Who? What audience are you writing this column for? Um, it drives students a little bit crazy that I always make them identify who their target publication or audience is for a, a column before they uh, write it, because how you write a piece is often defined by who the audience will be. I mean, your, your opinion on it won't change, but the lift you have to do to, to sort of convince that audience of what you're, what you're trying to argue is different depending on who you're trying to target. So if you're writing um, a piece that covers a conservative issue for a liberal audience, you might have more of a lift to do than if you're writing a conservative piece for a conservative publication and vice versa. If you're writing a piece that goes to a professional journal, they may be more knowledgeable about a particular topic than a general audience. So keeping that audience in mind is really critical when you're writing. It also helps you shape the article and gives you a way to think about where this piece might be placed so you don't end up with a beautifully written place with no home to go after you write it. Some things that become important for a column, and this is actually one of the few things that are left over from like your fifth grade writing class and that writing instructor who beat home the, the idea of a topic and a theme, is to get clear on the difference between a topic and a theme. So if you're trying to think about the difference between a topic and a theme, you can um, think about the topic as the 
broad issue that you're writing about. That's the broad, like think about the environment as a broad issue. If you're thinking about a theme, that's another level to the meaning of that topic. So it's the big overarching point you might want to make on the environment. So for example, um, Pranav Reddy, who was a student of mine, was writing a piece on an environmental issue, and he was talking about a new research that had come out that basically had shown that pollution had resulted in the premature deaths of 9 million people around the world. There was research uh, from a scientific journal that showed that. He was writing to a general audience saying that as a result of that new research, policymakers needed to take action. That was the point he was trying to make. So that's an environmental issue. The overarching point becomes the, the theme, the thing you want to get across in that point. So Pranav's whole piece was about this issue of pollution and how policymakers needed to respond based on this new research. The overarching point needs to be established early on in the piece in something we call a nut graph. If you go back to uh, Pranav's piece, uh, like two or three paragraphs in, he wrote, the pollution problem largely remains neglected by policymakers, funding organizations, and the media. Globally, the pollution agenda draws only a fraction of the hundreds of millions of dollars of annual funding that goes towards other public health threats like HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Why isn't pollution on our radar? And then that's the nut graph. That's where he's establishing his overarching point. And then he goes on in his piece to actually say why we should be focusing on that and why policymakers should be pay paying attention to it. So establishing the overarching point early on in the piece is critical. The things to remember again, to repeat, what's my topic? What's my overarching point? So topic and theme, topic and theme. The overarching point is what you're trying to do in this one column. If you're thinking about who your audience is, it sort of helps you think about how to make that overarching point. So if you're writing for a general audience, as Pranav did, he's trying to raise awareness. That's one thing. So he's trying to raise the issue. If you're trying to raise it in a policy journal, he's writing directly to the policymakers. So it might be more specific on the actions specifically that the policymaker should take as opposed to the raising awareness. So remember when you're writing that how you write the piece and how you sort of support that overarching point is driven a bit by who you're trying to address. Again, you're not changing what your argument is based on who the audience is. You just have a different kind of uh, support you need to do to sort of reach that audience. Research is important. Um, this is sort of a question of how do you know what you know? There's an old journalism expression that journalists tell each other that if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. Don't take anything for granted just because you read it online, because you read it in somebody else's article or in some other report. Double check your facts, make sure things are accurate. So one of the exercises I often have students do is I show them this piece of wood, which is a piece of wood, you can see that it's not been tampered with. And I ask them what it is, and generally they recognize that it's something that's identified as a two by four. Go on to ask them why is it called a two by four, invariably they, somebody will say, well, it's because it's two inches by four inches. I ask them how they know that. Generally it's because they just know that. And then someone will say, well, that's two inches by four inches. So they ask them, well, how can they how can they sort of support that it actually is two inches by four inches? And they say to measure it. So I get a tape measure and have them measure it. And you will see, actually, I'll see if this works. You will see that actually this is three and a quarter inches by one and a half inches. So actually a two by four is actually one and a half inch by three and a quarter inches. And you know, Everybody knows it's a two by four, they know what to ask for. This becomes important to check the facts if you're a builder and you're framing a house. Those are differences, they all know that, framers of house know that, but it's important to know that difference so your house can be sturdy, you can have a sound structure, but don't take anything for granted. Always check everything out. Make sure that if someone tells you a two by four, you check it out. Research basically, is acquiring facts, quotations, citations, data from sources and personal observation. Um, if you can have sensory data in a piece, touch, taste, smell, and sound, if you can describe something, it brings it to life. Often when you're starting a column and we're, um, you start with something called a hook to bring people in, it often could be something from new research, as I referenced back with Pranav's piece on the environment, 
and 9 million premature deaths resulting from that based on a recent study. That's a hook that you can use, but often it's a story that you tell. You're painting a scene, so you, you paint a scene by including sensory data. And the way you do that is by going to the scene, capturing that data. Often you can't do that, so you find another way to do that through either an interesting new piece of research or telling a story from the past that you know, telling a personal story, something to engage the reader and hook them in. Two basic types of research, uh, field research, going to the scene, interviews or legwork. There's also library or internet research, which is using secondary materials. Those are the things you want to double check if it's somebody else's reporting or data. Always go to the original source if you can. If you're doing field research and you're interviewing people, one, one quick tip to keep in mind when you are interviewing someone is that um, if you're interviewing someone, there's often a sort of a, a moment when there's a pause, when you ask a question and the, you're waiting for the person to answer and there's a pause. And there's often a pause in the discussion. The temptation is that because of the discomfort of that, that pause and that silence causes is for you as the interviewer to fill that void. Fight that urge. Um, Robert Caro, who uh, is a legendary biographer of, of Robert Moses and Lyndon Johnson, in a recent book that he talks about in writing, um, mentions that he does this. And he used to do this when he was taking handwritten notes. He would use the initials SU when he was interviewing people. And that stood for shut up. And it taught, it sort of was to tell himself, don't talk, don't talk, let them talk. Because often when, when there's that discomfort and the other person's feeling it, that's often when the most unguarded and the most unslick and unpolished and the most honest response comes to the question that you're answering. So let the person you're talking to answer the questions. And that's basically, so research becomes very important for what you're talking about. Openings become really important for a column, for the hook. If you're looking to write a piece, you want to engage them. So for example, I mentioned the Pranav piece where there's a new piece of research. Um, this also becomes important because often um, students in particular will ask me, well, who am I to write this piece? What standing do I have? What expertise do I have? In Pranav's case, Pranav was a, a joint student between Harvard Kennedy School and Brown's Medical School. And he, um, he was a student. He wasn't an expert in environmental or pollution, but he, ha he had come across this interesting research that had been done that showed there were um, 9 million premature deaths as a result of pollution. And that was an interesting piece of research, and he was presenting it in a new way. So that gave him the standing to write that, that piece. It was the interesting bit of information he had to present to people. But often the standing you have to write for a piece has to do, and you can open in the piece with, um, if it's not a piece of research, you can open it with a story. So you can tell a compelling story. It can be from personal life, something only you can tell, and that gives you the standing. A piece that um, another student named um, Marta Hansen wrote a piece for WBUR's Cognoscenti. She started her piece um, that basically said, my, my grandmother died this morning. We knew she was nearing the end as my family celebrated her 100th birthday last week on Zoom. She opened her eyes just twice each time at the cacophony of loving gibberish from 12 little boxes singing happy birthday, the melody broken by virtual distance. I didn't hug my grandmother, my nana, in the months before she died. She lived in a state away behind layers of pandemic precautions too risky, too far. I didn't hug my mother either on the day her mother died. That was unexpected. My parents lived just 15 miles away, and since moving home to Oregon earlier this year, I've helped them through the transition to virtual work, a COVID scare in the aftermath of a windstorm that felled the tree next to their house, narrowly missing the roof and my mom. That same windstorm spread the fires. So she was talking, Marta was talking about the, the fires that were going on in the Pacific Northwest at the time and using that story as a way to, to write a piece about the, the effects of the fires out there. It was a compelling story, um, a way to sort of lay out what she was going to be writing about in her column. Uh, so openings, again, become very important. In the same tone, endings become very important. Um, the, there are basic requirements of an ending not all of these, but um, if you think about them, they will answer or, um, or echo an introduction. It's been foreshadowed. You don't want something coming out of the blue at the ending of a piece. It's the last and often most memorable piece of a timeline, and it contains some kind of takeaway, final takeaway for your reader. Um, if, you, if you think about it, there's different types of endings. You, you're going to choose one of these or a variation of these. There's an answered argument where you 
start an you sort of present an argument in the beginning of your column in Pranav's case with the pollution. It might be why aren't policymakers doing about this? What should they be doing about this? And then answering that argument at the end. There's a humorous illusion. Just keep in mind that humor can be a very funny thing and hard to pull off. Um, there's a resurrected symbol where you start out by talking about something in the beginning, some imagery, and it's slightly altered at the end based on everything that's come in between. And you come back to that symbol at the end. And there's a bookend moment, which is a literary device. Where in a novel, you'll often see a scene painted in the beginning and that same scene will come about at the end of the piece. That's a bookend moment. Every column will I have either an open ending or a closed ending. By far, the majority of columns will have a closed ending. A closed ending states rather than suggests a conclusion. It resolves the topic and theme neatly. An open ending leaves more to the imagination. It sort of leaves the reader pondering. It suggests rather than states a conclusion. It leaves the reader questioning. Open endings are much more challenging to pull off because you run the risk of leaving the reader thinking, you don't really know what the answer to the question is. You don't know what the argument is that you were trying to make in the piece. So unless you sort of have presented enough information in the column to really want to leave the reader pondering, go with the closed ending. There are a couple of famous examples of, of open endings. Um, there's um, one in the, the Sun Also Rises, a novel by Ernest Hemingway, which is about miserable people in Paris during the 1920s. And it ends by... Uh, the two main characters are Jake and Brett. Uh, Brett is the woman, Brett, Jake is the man. And they. Um, it ends with, oh, Jake, Brett said, we could have had such a damned good time together. Ahead was a mounted policeman in khaki directing traffic. He raised his baton. The car slowed suddenly, pressing Brett against me. Yes, I said, isn't it pretty to think so? So the whole novel ends in a question. It leaves the reader pondering. And I apologize for spoiling that novel for you if you haven't read it. Um, there actually is another example that I don't use that often. It's actually from the New Testament um, of the Bible. And uh, for me growing up, the, New, the Bible ended with the Old Testament because that's the way my people did it. Um, but in the, in the New Testament, there are four Gospels that, that sort of uh, talk about the, 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 the Christ story and the resurrection and the, com and the coming back. And the, um, in the book of Mark, which is one of the Gospels, there's actually, if you, if you look at the, uh, at the Bible, depending on what, which version you're looking at, there are two endings to Mark. Same story, uh, the story of Jesus coming back and resurrecting, that all stays the same. But there's a shorter ending of Mark that simply says, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterward Jesus himself sent out through, through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. That's it. That first version was going to people who would have already presumably been familiar with the, the story of the resurrection. The second version of the ending is one is about six or seven paragraphs, and it actually says, it starts with, now after he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had seen him. And it continues on, and it's actually in very explicit detail explains the various people and various things that happened after the resurrection. The audience for it might not have been as familiar with the resurrection story, so the, 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 the source material for it was actually longer and kept audience in mind. So the ending there kept in mind who the audience was for the piece. So keep endings in mind, and this is going to come in handy for what we're going to talk about in a few seconds after we talk about voice. Now, voice is one of the most challenging things for any writer to, to, to establish. People spend years trying to establish a unique voice. A column should have a unique voice of the writer because it's you, it's, it's you presenting your opinion. So uh, most columns will be conversational and something else. Think about yourself having a conversation with the person you're writing this to. You're having a conversation with them about this topic. And these are just some of the types of voices that could be in a piece. The list is endless, but these are some of the types of voices you could establish in your piece. Uh, one of the ways to check the voice for a piece, and I, I urge uh, students to do this all the time, is after you've written a piece, read it out loud. The pieces are generally short. It doesn't take, it probably takes maybe four minutes to read it if it's two pages long. Um, read it out loud. And doing this will accomplish a couple things. One is it'll help you catch typos, missed words, which editors hate when they get copied with missed words or typos. But it'll also help you get a sense of the voice you're trying to establish and the pacing for the piece. 
if you're reading the piece out loud and you find yourself out of breath by the time you finish the sentence, good chance that sentence is too long. If the piece feels too staccato and too, too, too like rat-a-tat-tat when you're reading it, then, then it's a good chance that there's too many short sentences and clip sentences together and you want to sort of vary them as you're going along. But when you're reading the piece out loud, see if it sounds like you. See if it get, has a sense of the voice you want to try to get across. And that's something that can be um, very useful to you in most anything that you write about, just sort of that sense of voice. So voice is important. It's something to work on. But reading aloud is a trick to use. I had a student um, in the past um, at that old university I used to teach, had a different student who just thought this was a terrible idea and he thought his roommates would think he was crazy and then he tried it, found that it worked and then he ended up writing a piece about how important it was to read a piece out loud to capture the, a sense of your voice and he wrote a piece on that for the writer magazine. So he was a convert. This is the slide that if you want to just pause now and just take a, take a picture of this, take a screenshot. This is, this is the traditional structure of an op-ed piece, of an opinion column. There's nothing that says you have to do this. No one's going to sort of drum you out of the op-ed writing core if you don't follow this structure. But most op-ed pieces will most often follow the, a structure that's very similar to this. And everything we've talked about up to now kind of builds to this. So it's it's something to keep in mind. I find that students who are driven by equations or or um, quantitative kind of things or need some kind of map really find this to be kind of a, a veil from the eyes kind of moment. They can use this as the equation for how to structure a column. Um, a med student who was trying to write a piece several years ago came by to see me. He wasn't a student of mine. He just was visiting and he was struggling with how to write it. I gave him this to look at. He immediately was able to do this and went on to write several pieces that ended up finding good homes. So the basic structure of a piece is the first two to three paragraphs are the hook, why do I care? Remember Marta's piece about the fire and her grandmother. Um, there's the setup, what the piece is about, and there's the nut graph. Remember Pranov's piece about why aren't policymakers paying attention to this issue? The nut graph is what's my overarching point. You don't give everything away, but you give the reader enough of a taste to know what the overarching point in the theme is. Again, the hook can be some kind of compelling research that you find that gives you the reason for being the pe person to bring that to the reader, or it can be a story, or it can be painting a scene, but it needs to be something that makes the reader care. Uh, there's a setup to, that sort of is a transition from the why do I care to the what's my overarching point. And then the meat of your, of your column is the next eight to 10 paragraphs, and that's the diagnosis and prescription. That's where you're fleshing out the problem or the issue and you're providing the solution for that problem or issue in that piece. So you can either do them, you know, four paragraphs of diagnosis, four paragraphs of prescription. Most often they're gonna be interspersed and they're gonna basically, that's the meat. That's where you're supporting your overarching point. Then you get to what most columns have and that's a concession. Um, and that's where you acknowledge that there's another side to the argument. There are topics where no concession is called for. If you're writing a piece on the evils of genocide, I think we're all agreed that genocide is bad and there's not really another side that can argue that it's good, at least in my book. But often there'll be another side to the argument. There, there might be a different way to approach something. There might be a different way to look at a, a policy issue. There might be a different way to look at the argument you're trying to make at the piece. You'll see often if you read a, a book review, um, let's say in the Sunday New York Times book review, there'll be a glowing and a wonderful review of a book and then you get to that second to the last paragraph and they'll talk about some shortcomings of the book to let you recognize that no book is perfect and they often place it there and then they come out of it and come back to why the book is good. You don't want to have the concession paragraph be a whole nother column that argues the other side. You just want to acknowledge that you're not, not so naive that you don't know there's another side. And you want your argument to be the strongest thing about the column. So often what you'd want to do is just sort of tip your hat to the other side, but be able to come out of it with a nevertheless, but in spite of this, but even recognizing that there's another side, I still believe strongly that the overarching point I'm trying to make is the one to believe. And that's what you get to in your final paragraph with a coda or a repeat of the overarching point or a call to action where you're asking people to do something where it's going to a, uh, an event or it's 
donating blood or it's doing something you want them to do. It can be one of those two things, but it has to be definitive. Um, if you can see this, this is a piece that appeared in uh, Bloomberg opinion column uh, on why there aren't more women at musical chairs. And visually, I want to give you a sense of how that structure works. And if you look at this, you don't need to read it very closely, but you can see that basically um, the first highlighted section with the with the paragraph is is the is the three things we talked about. It's the it's the hook, then there's the setup, and then there's the nut graph, which comes about four paragraphs in. And then for the next several paragraphs from the bottom of that first page until the three quarters down on the next page, that's the diagnosis and prescription. If you look at the second page, you have a concession there. Uh, and basically the writer's concession here was that it may take a while for the public to get used to having female conductors, but, um, and, but it ends that paragraph with, but it will. And that sort of is the way of coming out of the concession. And then there's a close. So again, this is the structure that you want to look at for a, a strong opinion column. And it's something that you can use over and over again. And you can use this in your other writing as well. This is actually a structure that works very well for a short argumentative essay, a persuasive essay that you want to use. But this is something, if you look at columns like the one I just mentioned to you, this is actually the structure that you will most often see or some variation of this. So if you're at a loss, this is a good place to start. Um, revisions becomes very important. Um, it's important to actually make sure that you get everything right in the piece and that the piece is as tightly written as possible and that it's it's simple with, to grasp the point you're making. That it's Simple doesn't always mean easy, but you don't want the, read, the writing to be so complex and so difficult to understand that the reader doesn't grasp what you're reading. You want the, the, what you're writing to be accessible. Um, you want to check direct quotations. You want to make sure the facts in your piece are right. Remember to look things up, be, be insatiably curious, make sure that the piece is consistent, that you don't find yourself contradicting yourself throughout. And then generally, um, just as a rule, I try to um, guide people when I'm look, talking to them about their writing is sort of apply the 25% rule. Get the piece as strongly written as possible, as tightly written as possible, and then cut it by 25%. Uh, short is better. Tight is better when you're writing an opinion column. They're short, but you want to make sure that you do have absolutely no excess in a piece. So if you apply the 25% rule and can get close to cutting it by 25% when you think it's absolutely done, I am pretty much guarantee you the piece will be stronger. After the revisions are done, you're going to want to know, what do I do with this piece? Now, often when you're writing a, a piece, if you get in the habit of writing pieces, you've established relationships, you can start pitching opinion pieces before you write them when you have enough of an argument and enough research done to know you could write it. If you have the piece already written, um, then you have a piece to pitch. But this is the idea for a pitch letter that you would write to an editor of a publication who might be interested in the piece. And these are some general things to remember. Remember to check the submission guidelines for a piece, uh, to, to, um, to look stuff up, to double check all facts, to make sure that you're clear that your piece is right for the audience you're pitching, um, to make sure your point is clearly stated. Um, and if you're looking for a formula, again, for those of you who are formula oriented and want to know how to do this in a way that sort of works. In the old days, pitch letters would often be longer than the piece itself. They'd be written by mail, but now most pitch letters are written by, by email. And this is sort of a, a structure for a five paragraph, strong pitch letter that can get results and get the attention of an editor who's being drawn in a lot of different directions and pitched a lot of different things at once. So the first paragraph, um, first of all, start in the subject line by telling them why you're pitching them. In the subject line, say, uh, pitch for an op-ed piece on and then give the topic. Editors like to know why they're getting the email. Uh, if you're including the column with the piece, I only suggest including it if they ask to see it. Otherwise, I'd hold back. But if you're including it, don't just include it as attachment, but paste it into the file because there's some nervousness about opening files these days. But the pitch letter itself. Tell the editor what you're pitching. They want to know why they're getting this email. Then tell them who you are. Um, and then um, we'll come back to that in, in paragraph four. Tell them why this column is perfect for their audience. They want to know that you're not just pitching this out of the blue to everybody and they're one of many people that you're pitching to. While that may be true, you want to pitch it to that publication and make sure that it's perfect to them. 
In op-ed writing, you generally pitch things serially. So one at a time, you don't want to pitch to 20 different publications at once. You want to pitch to a publication, wait for their response, and then pitch to the ne next publication if they're not interested. This risks burning bridges. Um, so you want to tell them why the column is perfect for that publication. Then you want to tell them why you're the ideal person to write this piece. And again, this gets to standing. Who am I to write this piece if I'm not like the leading expert on pollution? And in Pranav's case, again, he was the person to write this piece because he came across this data. He had compelling data and a way to talk about it to a general audience. That might be one way to do it. You have a compelling story to tell. Your, your hook sort of establishes the reason for the reader wanting to read this. That gives you the standing to write this. And you want to make sure that they know you can deliver on this. And then I always suggest you end by telling them you'll follow up in a day, in three days. Um, I think the New York Times says, if you don't hear from us in three business days, we're not interested. So three business days, but to tell them you'll follow up, that's sort of another nudge that you can use to, to uh, awaken the editor's interest. So in, if you say you're gonna follow up in three days, follow up in three days. And that leads back to the three questions I started with that if you can answer, you probably might have a really strong opinion column in you. And that's, do I have a point? What is it? What's my overarching point? And who cares? Who's my audience for that piece? And that's it. That's basically what I've got. Uh, thank you. The, the um, communications program at the, uh, the Kennedy School is a great resource for you. If you go to hkscomprog.org and click on the channel on the left that says resources, uh, and then in there, there'll be a section on op-eds and there is a variety of resources there. And basically I'll leave you with the idea that the, the best way to get good at this is to read voraciously and write voraciously and then write again and write more and write as much as you possibly can, read as much as you possibly can, and then repeat. Write, write, write. That's the best way to become a better writer. Uh, and that's why I use the hashtag ABW, which is always be writing. So you'll see that on my window at the Kennedy School. Uh, you'll see it as a tag to various emails I write. Always be writing, ABW. I think it's actually behind me here somewhere. Behind me, you can see it. ABW, always be writing. So that's it. I got to go. I got to go write. Thank you.